Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Marquette University Law School, the virtual Lou Bar Center. I'm Mike Goucher, and this is On the Issues. Today, we're talking about justice in the time of COVID. Uh, this last year for all of us has been a year of adjustments, a year of learning to live uh, with a virus that is still causing problems in our community. But we thought it'd be an excellent time to talk about what has transpired over the last year in terms of justice in our community. How have we been able to do the things we have historically done given the challenges presented by the pandemic? We have four guests with us today. First of all, Chief Judge Mary Trigiano of the Milwaukee County Circuit Court. We have Milwaukee Municipal Court Judge Derek Mosley with us today. The Regional Attorney Manager of the State Public Defender, uh, Defender's Milwaukee Trial Office, Tom Reed is with us. And so is Milwaukee County District Attorney John Chisholm. Thanks so much to the four of you for being with us. And Chief Judge Trigiano, I'll begin with you because you were just new into this role as Chief Judge when the virus hit and when it really became pronounced in March. And I'm wondering if you would take us back to that moment in time. Tell me what was going through your mind. What were your concerns? Sure, thanks, Mike. First, I'd like to thank you and Dean Kearney and the Marquette Law School for um, hosting us here today. We certainly have a lot of information to share, so thank you. I became chief judge February 10th, and then I always say my claim to fame was shutting the courthouse down and sending everybody home one month later. Um, but I think, you know, we, we, we really did an amazing job because of the relationships that we have with each other in the justice system. Uh, John's office, Tom's office, um, Judge, you know, Derek Mosley, just great relationships, uh, which made everything, our crisis management planning and our recovery efforts um, go as smooth as possible, so to speak. But I think the biggest thing that I saw was we had to somehow do this great balancing act between our constitutional mandates and our essential functioning, but also balance that against public health and public safety. Um, and, you know, we're not used to doing that. We're used to just doing business as usual and trying to figure everything out. So, um, we did use experts such as public health experts to help guide us, which was really tremendously helpful. Um, and we knew right away that once we shut down, we had to, within a blink of an eye, start to come back up to provide that access to justice. And so we really pulled together um, in an all out hands-on effort to do so. Um, I think the introduction of using um, different video conferencing platforms was absolutely critical to getting us back, um, at least um, trying to address some of the cases that we needed to do, especially those of the criminal courts. So um, that's, you know, that's the essential functions that we had to do and, and uh, we continue to do that today. I want to, uh, I'll go to uh, John Chisholm and Tom Reed in just a moment, but I did want to bring uh, Judge Mosley into this because Municipal Court, Milwaukee Municipal Court is a place where you have literally tens of thousands of cases a year uh, passed through this court. Um, so there is a lot of business to be done. The pandemic hits and obviously it has a major impact on your court, but it also had a major impact on you. And I, I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about that. I mean, it did point out to all of us just how serious this virus was. Yeah, Mike, thank you. Um, yeah, so in the end of March, I uh, contracted uh, COVID and not really quite sure where I contracted it from, but it became such an, uh, it was so difficult for me to breathe that um, being a transplant recipient, I knew that the oxygen to my organs were important. So um, they immediately checked me into the ICU uh, where I was there for approximately 12 days trying to uh, fight off this virus. So this whole concept of how the court was going to operate had a pretty personal level for me because not only um, had I experienced it firsthand, but um, I got so close to death that I realized that, you know, there are things more important than just what we were doing on a daily basis. How was, uh, when you were talking to your colleagues after you began to recover and after you started feeling well, what were they describing to you? What were the challenges they were seeing in your court? Yeah, it was interesting because we were in contact, constant contact. Even when I was in the ICU, we were still in contact because we we're trying to figure out how we were going to handle all these cases. Um, as you mentioned on the start, we are a pretty high volume court uh, dealing with the municipal ordinance violations. So 
Um, our idea was to just go completely vir virtual. Um, there was no way we thought it was safe to bring, because uh, generally on a normal day, Mike, when we would bring people in for court, we'd bring them in a clip about 75 to 80 people would come into the courtroom and sit down. Um, and that made it extremely difficult to do that, socially distancing those people. So um, virtual seemed to be the option. Uh, fortunately for us, um, we're all electronic court. So um, we have employed this community court concept. So uh, we've been using laptops and conducting court from various locations anyway. So um, that wasn't that much of a uh, pivot for us. But at the same time, we wanted to make sure that everybody who wanted to have their cases heard, we're going to have them heard safely. Uh, John Chisholm and Tom Reed, from your perspective, w when the pandemic hits, I'm sure a lot of things are going through your mind. How do cases move forward? Um, and and I'll, I guess I'll begin with John Chisholm. As from the prosecutor's standpoint, what were your concerns as we we initially shut down and then had to regroup and figure out a new way forward? Yeah, thanks, Mike. And again, I hope I hope all of your audience is safe and healthy, and we're we're all grateful that uh, Derek has has recovered and is back uh, back operating at uh, at peak peak efficiency as always. Um, you know, it's a great question. Um, I would have to reemphasize that the pre-existing relationships that were built on uh, shared experience and trust, um, particularly the framework that was created by the Community Justice Council actually gave us the framework we needed um, to, first of all, just meet together, and it was still in person in those early days, um, but then also um, to step back from our, our traditional roles and say, what do we need to, um, to make informed decisions here? And again, a pre-existing relationship between my chief deputy and Tom Reed um, with a, a former um, um, city of Milwaukee health department, um, um, public health doctor, um, Joff Swain, um, Tom recommended that we actually bring Joff in to help, help us understand what was going on because it's, we, we've learned so much about, about this virus in the last year, but we have to go back to that time in March where we didn't know anything. And so we tried dusting off old templates about how you would deal with a pandemic and, and things like that. But it was incredibly helpful to have the uh, informed advice of a medical professional. And going forward, I think that um, we've often talked about how we would love to adopt a, a public health framework for addressing the issues that come into the criminal justice system. Well, this was an opportunity to do it for real. And, and the, the words we used at the time were that um, public health was public safety at that point in time. If we didn't make the right decisions early on to try to protect our own people. So as a prosecutor, uh, my first obligation was to make sure that my people were safe so that they could, they could do the essential functions that they have to do to keep other people safe. And so that required um, just an enormous amount of creativity and, and experience to take advantage of the tools that we already had and to expand them, primarily the ability to work remotely and do that quickly and come up with different systems. Other key partners I would have to, to include, obviously the relationship between Tom's office and my office allowed us to um, immediately at the advice of, of Dr. Swain, he said, look, the, the one thing I'll tell you right now is that congregate settings are going to be lethal and you have the most concentrated congregate settings in the state, in your jail and in your house of correction at your secure detention facility, um, you really have to think about how you're gonna try to control that. And we all agreed to do that and, and working, you know, really night and day to identify people that we could safely release and yet still keep the eye on, on the public safety allowed us to uh, adopt a, a practice that, that went to single cells when possible. And that helped the sheriff's department, it helped the house of correction to actually manage this in the early months. And then we had to build upon that as we went forward. But again, I just wouldn't be able to overemphasize the, the value of these pre-existing relationships that are built on trust and, and the fundamental principle being, let's do the right thing. Uh, let's make sure that, that 
Um, we're doing everything in our power to keep people safe and still perform our functions and build back into it in a informed and thoughtful way. Uh, Tom Reeve, uh, from the, the perspective of the Public Defender's Office, um, what were you most concerned about? Obviously, public safety is, is job one. Everybody has to stay safe. But you're representing uh, clients who are indigent. Uh, you don't want to see a backlog in cases. What was on your mind as, as this pandemic really took hold? Well, I, um, for, I first, I, I share the statements of gratitude to you know, the law school and the Lubar Center and um, you know, to the partnerships that have been referred to because they really count a lot in a moment like this. Um, I, I'll answer your question, but just to give a little historic context around how, this, how we thought about this, we had been meeting uh, in connection with the possibility that the entire court system and a good part of the downtown Milwaukee area was going to be closed you know, because of the Democratic National Convention. And we were in the process of having discussions about what would happen if, if for example, you really couldn't safely get into the courthouse complex. What would happen if we had to have um, all of our staff working remotely? And all of those discussions were kind of on this time frame that, well, we'll answer those questions by May or June of 2020, because that's a, you know would be the appropriate time frame in which to solve the problems. And I would say within two weeks, we had implemented ideas that seemed pretty hard to imagine getting done before June. So the mad scramble that that was, you know, just just the mechanics of getting a hundred staff people out of the um, out of this office, and we are not endowed with remarkable IT assets. So we had to maximize the use of our IT assets so that was possible. Then we had to figure out, well, how are we going to conduct some of our business, which is normally done in person. And so our first appearances were always done in the back room behind the, um, you know, uh, court, you know, in, in the criminal justice facility. We interviewed clients, we screened them for mental health issues, we did all sorts of things with them. And, and it was not safe for the jail to be moving people back and forth in and out of that that back room and then into a courtroom. So that all had to be moved you know, to a virtual platform. So there was that kind of thing which occupied a huge amount of time. Um, the deeper concerns though still remain to some extent. Um, there are today a very substantial number of people sitting in jail who are facing homicide charges, sexual assault, assault charges, you know, other kinds of aggravated felony charges. And although you'll hear in our discussion today about the fact that I think ahead of a lot of other communities in the country, urban communities in the country, we have managed to have some trials take place. We're not really moving those backlogged cases very rapidly. And, you know, that's a concern for, for clients, for their families. It's a concern for the witnesses that have to, you know, be prepared to testify in those cases when they go forward. And whatever stresses that affect the lawyers and the staff and the courts, those pressures are even greater for the people in custody and for the communities from which most of the clients come. And so we have been able to help clients get to court by making Zoom appearances but a lot of the clients don't have enough minutes on their cell phone. They don't have a private place. You know, like I love watching, you know, people appearing on Zoom on the on TV programs because you know you'll see them sitting in front of a lovely array of, of books that they've read or whatever. You know, our clients are in the laundry room or they're in the, a car, you know, outside on the street because that's the only private place that they, they can find. So navigating all of those client service issues and trying to help the people wherever we could who are in custody to get their cases brought to a resolution, you know, continues to be one of our challenges. And I think we've made more progress than I would have predicted in April 15th if I had looked forward and said, I wonder how this is going to go. Um, but it, it took time. 
I think the last thing I, I would say that happened that is worth noting, and I think Judge Mosley's experience is relevant to this. I remember at the very beginning, as Helen mentioned, we were meeting in person, you know, in the Office of Emergency Management for the county, organized some, some meetings so people could understand, you know, kind of what we, what we were up against. But I would say within a week or 10 days, that period when everything had to change, it dawned on, on everyone how dangerous this was. Um, we started to see stories coming out of New York City where, where, you know, even in April, you know, they had freezer trucks outside of hospitals because they didn't have the ability to handle the people who are dying. And I think that caused, you know, just was a wake up call in the most fundamental way to everybody about just how aggressively we were going to have to, to rethink everything that we're doing. It's interesting when, when I hear all of you talk about adjustments that had to be made. Um, uh, I, I'd like to spend a little bit more time on that because I mean, all of us entered this Zoom world. That's the way we did our business and 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 that's the way justice has been delivered and, and to a large extent. I mean, there are some in-person things that we'll talk about later, but for the most part, uh, Zoom has become just this huge part of the justice system. How much of a learning curve, uh, Chief Judge Trigiano, was there uh, for people to make this work effectively? Well, that's a great question, Mike. Um, I think as with everything else, there is sort of a continuum of people. Some absolutely know and love playing with technology and some are like fish out of water and are still struggling with it and continue. And that's, that's just the users in the courthouse. We're also talking about individual litigants who are trying to access these um, uh, remote video conferencing hearings. Um, but it, if I look back, um, it is actually a blur to me, but we, I think all knew that we had to provide access in some way. And with 4,500 people entering this courthouse on a daily basis, as well as children's court, there was no way we were going to be able to um, do a slow step rise recovery without having a, a video conferencing platform. And so we immediately adopted a remote friendly or remote first sort of policy. And I remember that um, uh, the director of state courts, uh, Judge Koshnick, um, basically emailed the chief judges uh, across the state and said, I purchased 500 Zoom licenses, here you go. And by the way, I have nobody in my office or at CCAP that actually really quite knows how to use these. So you're, you're sort of at your, your own, right? Um, but we pulled together people with more knowledge about um, the technology. Um, you know, we fumbled through it in the beginning. We started to use it. We're still having issues with it. And then we met with uh, the county, as I call it, the county recovery team, um, who decided along with us in our, in our collaborative meetings that they would take a chunk of the CARES dollars that were coming to Milwaukee County in sort of that technology pod. And they said, look, we think we can outfit every one of your courtrooms with sort of the Zoom technology, um, which will reduce all the issues that you're having with feedback and this and that and the other thing. And so we sort of created this this Zoom platform and started get, getting everyone trained on it. Um, and so that's how we started sort of in, in, in the fog, as I say, but we are, we're coming out the other end more knowledgeable about it and trying to deal with it. Just this morning, I was in a courtroom um, where uh, we potentially will do a um, Zoom jury trial. So the jurors will be in one courtroom on Chromebooks and the litigants and the judge and everyone else will be in another room because we don't have enough space. So they'll be conducting hopefully it through um, the Zoom platform, a whole jury trial. So we're trying new things. Um, it is at least evident that many litigants um, are that haven't been accessing before potentially because they have jobs and they can't come down to the courthouse so they just end up not coming to their court hearings or they have children and they don't want to bring them down to the courthouse 
are now gaining access to uh, these hearings. I think there's a lot of data that we need to look at because Tom's right, there are people who don't have enough um, bandwidth or phones, et cetera. But I think as we meet and we continue to work at these issues and try to provi provide a better user experience, we're all gaining more knowledge in doing that. Judge Mosley, uh, talk for a moment, if you would, about the technical proficiency of, of the people, your peers, but also the people who use uh, municipal court. Uh, are we in a place where everybody understands how things work? Uh, right now we are, as far as municipal court is concerned. But as uh, Mary had pointed out, the initial uh, learning curve uh, for uh, litigants who are coming to our court was in fact quite difficult. Uh, as far as the three judges at municipal court, we were pretty comfortable with it. Um, as I had mentioned a little earlier, we had moved to like a community court model. So we were holding a veterans court at the armory already on my laptop. Uh, I was holding a homeless court at the guest house uh, and the rescue mission. And we were doing our warrant withdrawal programs as well uh, at various locations throughout the city. So as far as a technology standpoint was concerned, we were ready for that move. And as Tom mentioned, with the DNC coming in our proximity to the Pfizer Forum, we were in that, that circle, uh, security circle. So we were already prepared to be holding court outside of our building anyway. And so when, um, when all this happened, uh, the three judges and our court staff were ready for the move because it was something that we were familiar with. However, the defendants did have an initial uh, problem uh, as the, the, the comments that Tom mentioned with bandwidth and places to find a private location. But we also offer uh, in our court, you can come in. Um, if you come into my court right now, there is a giant screen uh, where I would normally sit and you would see me as you see me today on that screen. The only other person in the courtroom is my bailiff uh, for security purposes. My clerk is remote as well. And so there were individuals who opted, uh, most of them um, older, who opted to come into court and we made it safe and available for them. They had the courtroom to themselves. But most of the people opted for the uh, option uh, to come virtually. And many of them opted for it before they even knew what Zoom was. So and it was a lot of, you're on mute, you're on mute, or uh, please make sure you hit audio, internet audio, internet audio. Uh, but once, um, once that got going, it, it, it really changed the way we operated. In, in municipal court, even though the court itself in tickets is high value, uh, a lot of the defendants don't appear. And so they just choose not to, to come to court. What was really nice about our this virtual platform, mm -hmm. defendants appear. Our, mm -hmm. our appearances went way up. And um, it, it, I don't know if it's the same um, for my colleagues, but I mean, I had people appearing at, from work I had people appearing, um, uh, they were doing home health care and they were appearing, I could see the person they were caring for them behind them over their shoulder. There were people uh, I had to make pull over because they were doing their court hearings in their car. Uh, I mean, it's just, it, it just became uh, really accommodating. And uh, just for a procedural purpose, uh, when it comes to attorneys, attorneys always go to circuit court first. Um, it's a more important court proceeding. So they always go there first. So we would wait hours waiting for attorneys to come to our court because they uh, were in circuit court waiting for their cases to be called. Now I have attorneys with two laptops, they're appearing in my court, then they shift over and they turn, they're appearing in circuit court. So they're able to make multiple appearances um, and we don't have to wait around, we can handle other cases why, while we wait for them. Um, I just had a case this morning where the uh, defendant was an over the road trucker and he did his appearance from a truck stop in Arizona. Um, and that would have been a case where he just would have not shown. But now um, the availability has made it very accommodating for, because remember, I don't deal with criminals. I deal with everyday people who are coming in, who happen to get anything from a parking ticket to a disorderly conduct ticket to whatever it may be. So uh, I thought for our purposes, it became more accommodating to people to the point now, the vast majority of our appearances are virtual. Judge Trigiano, very, very briefly, I wanted to come back to you because uh, I have heard that, that the same has been said about circuit court, that you have, in fact, for civil cases, probate court, uh, court cases, 
that actually, in some respects, this virtual world has encouraged people to be present more frequently than might, they might be otherwise. Yeah, I think that's true. I think that's anecdotal because we yeah. think we want to focus on really, you know, how good this technology is. I think there's more data that we need to delve into because I think we are, there's a whole group of people who don't have access right now. But anecdotally, from children's court to small claims to a criminal proceedings, people are saying, the judges are saying, man, there's more people showing up, like Derek said, right? And so I think that's good. And I think that means that looking into the future, we should really um, probably create sort of a hybrid process where people can continue to come in to Zoom hearings. I would also say that along with the really deep and good collaborations that we've had, we're creating new collaborations um, to help us provide access to individuals. Um, in particular, the Milwaukee Public Libraries uh, and Vader Philanthropies and a group got together, connected with us here at the courts and said, look, we want to create Zoom hearing rooms in our Milwaukee Public Libraries and we can use CARES dollars and we can use a grant to do that. So we're in the process of building that with them right now and testing the waters so that people can go down to their corner library instead of having to come downtown to connect into their court cases. We're testing that right now with um, small claims eviction proceedings. Um, and so, you know, very unique collaborations are coming from this crazy pandemic that we're dealing with. And, uh, and I think that's a really good positive thing that's happening in our community. Tom Reed and, and John Chisholm, I, I want to ask you each essentially the same question here. And, and it's a very basic question. Uh, Tom Reed, I'll begin with you. Can your people, your attorneys, do their job as effectively in this new virtual world as they could when they were doing more of an in-person uh, type of work? Yeah, so it's a mix, right? I, I certainly strongly agree with the idea that having Zoom as a capable, as an asset to uh, for clients is advantageous. Every winter, even in these mild winters like the one we're having this year, um, we have a lot of clients who just can't get to court in time and they end up having warrants issued because they weren't there. And unfortunately, when people have warrants, then other bad things follow from that. You know, you become afraid, you know, of being picked up and maybe you, you know, flee from the police because you're, you just don't want to be arrested or whatever happens. I mean, a warrant is a really damaging thing to someone's well-being. So to the extent that Zoom technology can really help get things done, get clients into court, especially at the beginning when some of the procedural matters are being discussed, I think that's a big advantage. Needless to say, however, the work that we do for clients requires a, a real contact with them. And we've all learned by sitting on Zoom hearings that there's a lot of information that people share with us when we're in their presence. It's nonverbal for sure, but it's really important, you know? And no matter how effective the camera is on your computer monitor, it's just not the same, you know? And sometimes when people are faced with making very difficult choices, which is often the case for criminal defendants, you know, we'll just observe the person hesitating, we'll see the tensing up of the muscles, or there some kind of very subtle change in the posture, gestures, or expressions. And an experienced lawyer knows, I'd better judge, can we just have a minute? And I'll turn to the client, what's up? You know, what, what is it that's causing you, because I can see it, you know? What's happening? And well, you know, that's not quite right what the DA just said. And and here and, and we learn from the client something that's important and we bring it into the case. You just can't do that in the same way when um, when you are working remotely. So that's one thing about it. And I think what has as a consequence, what the lawyers are doing now is they're making decisions about how what in which cases even with a pandemic and even with our restricted in-person court appearances, in which cases do I absolutely have to be in person with this client in order to be able to really accomplish what it is that I need to? 
And when is it a situation where the decisions the client has, has made are fairly straightforward and the complexity of what has to be decided is fairly straightforward? And we can have that plea in sentencing even on a Zoom hearing, and we're not going to worry that we're going to miss something important, you know? And I think that is an evolving practice skill. I think the other thing that has a big effect is that we have clients who are in custody, and in the past, we would go into the jail or the House of Corrections, or frankly, a state prison, and we would sit in a small room with a table and be able to look across the table at the client. And because there has been so much COVID-19 in a lot of these correctional institutions, you can't do that anymore. So even when you see them in person, it's through a glass window, you're on a phone, they're on a phone, and you, there are lots of times where we think that the clients don't develop the kind of quality relationship with their lawyer because they don't have that human contact that really is important. So it's a mix is kind of what I'm saying to you. Uh, John Chisholm, uh, can, can the people in your office, the prosecutors in Milwaukee County, uh, still do their job as effectively as they could before the pandemic? The way I would answer that question, Mike, is that um, we have all, as, as system actors, been committed to trying to improve the culture uh, within, within the, um, the actual environment that we traditionally operate. And, and to see that that, that culture is, is actually reflected in a benefit to the community. In, in other words, we're, we're, we're making decisions that uh, achieve a better, better quality of, of justice and that uh, our, our goal is always to keep people safe, but do so in a way that respects their, their civil liberties and makes this community healthier. So I would say that, that the benefits of what we've learned from this process are, are tremendous in terms of making us more efficient in, for example, um, obtaining for information. Our law enforcement partners stepped up to the plate right away. They are now they are now sending us all of their information in an electronic format. So you can see the benefits of that. Um, the the ability to contact victims sooner. We've been actually able to track that, and we've been able to improve the turnaround time uh, for contacting victims and and providing them information. Where I think it is is not been helpful is in the positive aspects of of the culture. And I think Tom was addressing that a little bit and and Derek and and, uh, Mary as well in that um, there are some real benefits um, to becoming a a competent um, practitioner in our system to actually interact on a a daily basis with real people and and to get that um, support quite frankly. I think that's what uh, many of our assistant DAs miss more than anything else is it's, it becomes a very tight, almost family-like uh, unit when you're faced with tremendous challenges and stresses. You depend upon one another for emotional support, for, for just a whole array of things that make the job so much more livable and enjoyable and, and bearable. And I think that that isolation has, has taken an impact on certainly on uh, people in our office, I'd assume the same is true for, for Tom's office, for the courts, and clearly for the community itself. I have to remind people that, that it wasn't enough that we just had to deal with, with a, a once in a century pandemic, um, but as, as deeply related to that, in my view, have, have been the other pandemics that we've been experiencing as a community. You know, this is 180 homicides this year, almost 800 non-fatal shootings. Um, overdose deaths and, and uh, record record numbers, um, suicides, uh, child deaths. All of these are what Tom often refers to as sort of the index of social suffering. And I think it's all been exacerbated because of our inability um, in, in, in some way for us to intervene earlier. And, and I, I would say one area that has not benefited from this process would be, for example, the incredible work that our pretrial service people do, um, forming that actual connection with somebody that has a mental health issue or, or a drug addiction issue and, and forming that human connection with them 
And I think that's been disrupted. And I think it plays into why we're seeing increased numbers at the medical examiner's office and why we're seeing people under uh, other levels of stress. In other words, there's a role for us to play in interacting with people as people. And, and hopefully that intervention leads to, to better outcomes in the future. So, um, so yes, we can do our jobs, um, but, I, but I don't think we'll ever be able to do it um, as effectively uh, unless we're, we're working together in, in the form that we, we operate best, which is you know, person to person, so that you can actually see the humanity in front of you. Uh, Chief Mike, Judge, Mike, oh, yeah. pl oh, please go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, if one thing to, to say about uh, about this is that I think despite all the efforts, and they have been really significant, the lawyers and the judges, you know, are carrying these very large backlogs because we just have cases we can't get resolved. Um, and I think the lack of human contact that has been necessary to in order in order to have a very limited footprint inside these offices and inside the courthouse has an impact on it. And the way I would just explain that is that a lot of times the lawyers, you know, on both sides sit in the back of a courtroom, they're waiting for their case to be called, and they're chatting about something. Sometimes it's not immediately relevant to the resolution of the case that they have together, but those conversations help create a context in which some discussions and settlements are possible. They get on the elevator together at the end of a long day. They're going down to the parking structure or back to their offices. They have these conversations. You know, they're milling around in the hall. They have these conversations. A lot of those informal kinds of moments cumulatively contribute to the capacity of the system to resolve conflict and, and disagreements. And in the absence of that, the lawyers are not typically going on Zoom with each other. What they're typically doing is sending email back and forth. And email communications are really valuable for the fact that they're speedy and you can get to a lot of people quickly and all the things we know about email. But for those one-on-one -on -one conversations where people need to be in the presence of each other to really get to where they have to get to, we just don't have as much of that. And that contributes to the backlogs. Yeah, agreed. Email is is wonderful, but sometimes you can't really grasp the tone that it's be a statement is being made. Uh, and uh, there there are a lot of factors to it. So I, I completely understand what you're saying, Mike, Chief Judge Trigiano. Yeah, uh, go ahead. You were you wanted to jump in? Yeah. So, you know, I would echo um, what the tremendous amount of stress created by this pandemic. Uh, racial disparities um, and the, the, you know, the marches that occurred. I think we're all really taking a lot in, but I would have to say that the one thing I think we all decided from the beginning, and John, you were a part of that, and Tom um, and, and Derek to a certain degree with the municipal court, was that we were gonna take a very aggressive um, approach to communications. Um, and we all have our grids that we have and all of our meetings scheduled since day one of this pandemic, where we have decided we're gonna keep each other informed of what's going on and keep other people informed. So, you know, when I walk up and down the halls pre-pandemic, you can just watch the wheels turning and the communications going on. We actually brought that into Zoom hearings as opposed to doing nothing. And I think that was so important um, from support staff uh, to our criminal justice partners, to our, you know, people who work on housing and evictions, just across the board. I think if we probably looked at the number of meetings that each one of us has been in, um, it would be, you know, just countless and astronomical. But I think we did that on purpose because I do think that relieves some of the stress of the unknown, what's going to happen next, how are we going to do things? Um, and I think we were meaningful about that and purposeful, and I think that was important. I, I'm going to come back to you in a moment, but I, I did want to ask Judge Mosley to, to comment on something that, that uh, D.A. Chisholm had to say and sort of talking about the moment that Milwaukee finds itself in. Uh, you and I have spent a lot of years in this town. Uh, we certainly are familiar with its ups and downs. I'm wondering if, if what you see in your courtroom, do you see... Uh, the impact of the pandemic in different ways? Do you think you can make a link 
to, to what we've seen in terms of the pandemic and what you're seeing in your courtroom or other courtrooms in this community? Uh, Mike, you know, you know what's interesting with this whole pandemic, the thing that I've, I've noticed the most. So um, uh, unlike Mary and John and, and Tom, in municipal court, we don't have a lot of attorneys who come in representing clients. The vast majority of the defendants that appear in our court are pro se. So the one thing that's good about uh, the pandemic and us being virtual is that it's become a lot more expensive for people to come to our court. And what I mean by that is you don't have to pay for money to take a bus. Some people were Ubering to the court. And it's uh, MacArthur Square where people park is expensive to park. And so um, for our purposes, it's become less expensive for people and we've become more accessible. That being said too, um, more people feel comfortable going to trial. It's a lot different coming to the court, sitting in our lobby, waiting to be called into court. You don't want to look, make eye contact with people. You don't want to see someone you might know because you are in court. Now you're sitting on your couch or you're in your kitchen. And, and so um, I think it's a good thing that we're doing more trials, but people are feel more comfortable with the system. The thing that you mentioned about uh, you and I have spent a lot of time in this, in this town and things we've seen, I am absolutely shocked at the number of defendants who appear virtually or in person who know everything about my health story. It is, it, it is, and I don't know if they're telling me this before I get to a decision, but it, it's amazing just how close knit this community is. Um, people who appear as defendants in front of me telling me, you know, I was praying for you and uh, I saw the story on the news and uh, we are a close community. It may not seem that way because of uh, everybody being virtual, but we're connected more than we've ever been connected. And um, I, I, I've seen a lot, especially because we do building and, and housing cases, uh, zoning code violations. Those violations are the ones where you can see the pandemic having an effect. Um, People aren't able to correct violations that they have because they can't, they don't feel comfortable having workers come to their house or they they have to pay mortgage and they don't have the money to pay for the work to be done. So in those types of cases, it is abundantly clear that this pandemic's had such an adverse effect on how people operate in regards to how they can comply with court orders. Uh, Chief Judge Trigiano, I want to go back to something that uh, John Chisholm and Tom Reed were talking about, and that was the, the value of these personal relationships, the, the, the human touch uh, that, that to some extent has to be missing right now. Uh, bring us up to date on, on what's happening inside the courthouse. Uh, uh, what percentage of cases are now being heard in the courthouse? Because there is in-person activity there. It's just not to the extent it used to be. Yeah, great question. So we, we never really um, completely shut down our court processes. We had a footprint in the beginning where we were dealing with some criminal cases as well as in-person civil domestic violence injunctions. We thought those were absolutely necessary to continue to go forward in person here with a smaller footprint. Um, as we took a more of a slow approach to opening up, I think we're probably at 40% in person um, that includes mostly criminal trials, um, jury trials, as well as criminal plea and sentencing hearings. Um, we have one family court open, one civil court open, and um, the domestic violence court still uh, has an, uh, a court uh, going strong. So, and then we stopped for a while because we wanted to make sure that we weren't contributing to the spread in the community of the virus, that we didn't see too much COVID creep, as I call it, coming into the courthouse. And we've stayed pretty constant at about 40% in person and 60% via other the video conferencing platform. We also pretty similar at Children's Court. We did open um, a courtroom at Zufari uh, so that termination of parental rights matters as well as uh, CHIPS cases could proceed to jury trial if necessary. And then one courtroom at Children's Court is open for any kind of in-person hearings that need to be done. Short of that, we've been so very careful and not wanting to open more to create more of a, a footprint in this courthouse. Uh, how, how 
often do you have to reevaluate what you're doing? Because we are still in the midst of the pandemic. There's talk about a new mutation of this virus that could cause it to spread even more easily. How often are you and others in the justice system talking about what is appropriate for in-person uh, proceedings? Sure, just about every day. <laughs> um, I think I spend more time with John and Tom than I do with any of my family members um, because we're in meetings constantly. Um, and we have a variety of different meetings um, and groups that meet, and then we all sort of come together. But we are looking at it on a daily basis. We are looking at it with the county recovery team, which includes uh, public health experts. Um, in addition, the county's risk mitigation uh, team comes into the courthouse, in particular jury trials, because we're bringing jurors in. Um, they sit and they watch them from jury management to being in the courthouse for voir dire and then in the courtroom for a jury trial to make sure we are compliant um, with all of the risk mitigation, um, you know, uh, things that we need to do. And so we are reevaluating it constantly. And we think it's important because again, we don't want to be we don't want anybody to, you know, to experience COVID in here. And if we do, then we want to limit it. Um, and we don't want to add to anything in the, in the community uh, in terms of the spread. How much, uh, Chief Judge Trigiano, has it cost to make the courthouse safe, as safe as possible? So I think there's probably a human cost in terms of time yeah. involved in vetting all this. Um, and then there's certainly a financial cost. Um, I don't have the final numbers on financial costs, mm -hmm. but, um, I believe um, the Milwaukee County has pretty much depleted their supply, uh, financial supply from the CARES dollars, um, not just on the courthouse buildings, but in the county, um, across the county. Um, money went to plexiglass, um, the Zoom platforms that we have in our courtrooms, um, gutting out and rebuilding a jury trial courtroom at Zufari, masks, um, you know, cleaning, disinfectant and hand sanitizing uh, equipment. Um, so I think it was used very, the money was used very wisely to keep people safe and it's meeting out its purpose. I'm Reed and uh, I'll begin with you and we'll go to, to John Chisholm. Um, what do you see as, as next steps in this process? I mean, is it really, uh, we, we just have to do as Chief Judge Trigiano says, look at the data every day and, and make our best judgments uh, based on that. What, where do you see us moving uh, next in order to, to work our way through this pandemic? Um, well, I, I'll mention one thing that has not been stated before, which I think is, is essential to making forward progress, but it was also essential his, in historic terms. I think, fortunately, our legal community, and that's just everyone from the police and the sheriff's department on into their, all the different you know, clerk's office and the courts and the lawyers, there has been a, a, an acceptance of the fact that we don't know about our colleagues when it comes to their concerns about their personal health or their personal circumstances. And you know, there may be somebody who's perfectly healthy, but they have been taking care of an elderly parent and they would feel uncomfortable coming into the courthouse or being in congregate settings because they are afraid with, with justification that if they were to unknowingly carry COVID-19 to a vulnerable person, you know, something bad would happen. So whatever progress we make has got to be anchored in that core recognition that until we really have the pandemic under real control, that there are going to be differential impacts on, on the people who work and we have to accommodate that. And we can't be uh, doing that in a way that is um, harmful to people's psychological well-being. calling into question, you're just not really dedicated enough to your work, to your responsibilities, you should be here. We just don't see that kind of thing happening. Um, I, I think what I would say is that the courthouse environment feels, and this is what our lawyers say, and I think others have said, feels like a place where it is obvious that people are committed to having a safe environment. And although, you know, in a jury trial, when I'm seated at a table, 
there's now a plexiglass partition between me and the client. And there are definitely situations where as a lawyer, I might feel uncomfortable because I have to kind of roll back, <laughs> lean over, try to talk to that client. You know, there's a lot of discussion about how to make that work better. In general, I think people feel not frightened or uncomfortable or uneasy around the, the protections that have been put in place. Courtrooms really look very different. I think people feel like it is a safe environment. And one change that clearly has happened that's essential going forward is that across all these different work units, people have understood, I have to wear a mask. We have to be careful about it. And what's interesting to see is that when there's some breakdown in that kind of a consciousness, everyone notices it and it's commented on and there's some correction that, that, that takes place. So when I look at what, how we get out of it, certainly as vaccination rates go up, we will feel, I think, more comfortable with um, having more you know, in-person activity. But what our public health doctors have continued to advise us is that's a ways off. And you can maybe slowly add, as you, you know, learn from experience, slowly add a little bit more, jury, a little bit more jury capacity, a few more of those in-person appearances. But I think when we, to get the population here in this community uh, and around the country to 80% vaccination rate and, you know, get people comfortable with some continued vigilance, I think we're talking about the fall, you know, at the earliest, maybe later. And I think as anxious as people are to see speedy trials conducted and other things happening, I think people have learned from experiences like Judge Mosley had, there's a real risk by going too fast. There's a real risk by trying to, to do things that you shouldn't. And we had a, a, an experience where um, a unit in the Milwaukee Police Department of detectives all got COVID-19 and a whole bunch of cases had to be adjourned because everyone was either COVID-19 positive or they were in some kind of quarantine because of exposure. And those experiences linger in your understanding of what is possible. So I think we're slowly going to go up, but I think until we really feel like there's an all clear that's, uh, that's announced, it's going to not look like what it did. John Chisholm, uh, Tom raised a couple of interesting points there. And, and and I'm wondering, just as someone who has a pretty extensive staff to to manage or work with, whatever words you prefer to describe that relationship, but but how, how do you find out where they are in terms of their, their, their wellness, their overall wellness? They may be reporting to work, they may be doing their jobs, but this is an incredibly stressful experience for a lot of different people. How do you figure that out? And the other question being, do you, do you kind of share Tom's belief that this is gonna be gradual before we get back to any sense of normalcy? Yeah, to, to, the, uh, to the second question first, I feel a, a very strong sense of urgency um, for us to get as close to capacity as we can, as quick as we can, and as safely as we can. Because again, just in my bones, I feel that, that um, the way things spread, not just the virus, but the, the, the way vi uh, violence and, and um, other, other harms spread in this community uh, in the last year, um, that it's essential for us to be operating at all levels, uh, both intervention, you know, my, the, the work of our community prosecutors has been disrupted, um, um, the work of our early interventions programs, um, just the, the ability to, to try to prevent things from, from spilling out of control, to intelligently intervene um, with the right resources and and yes, uh, um, on the accountability portion that, that um, is necessary um, for, for the most um, extreme cases, we just play such an important role in, in helping moderate that. And, I, and when you can't do that, I think that's when, when things tend to, to spill out of control a, a little bit. In terms of, of the concerns that uh, my, my people have, um, they are the exact same concerns that, that everybody in this community has um, that um, 
that, that is dealing with um, the, the fear of trying to return um, into a setting that, that they're afraid may uh, expose them uh, to risk. So from my standpoint, um, getting the, getting the uh, vaccinations in the hands of, of uh, the people that are, are essential to getting this back up and running is going to help alleviate a lot of that concern. Uh, sure, you're going to have people that have different views on, on whether they want to um, receive the vaccine uh, or not. I, I don't think you have a lot of, of uh, distrust uh, among, among the practitioners themselves. I, I think that all of them want to get back in, into this um, to, to as much of the capacity as they possibly can as quick as they can. And um, yeah, communicating with them, um, relying on on the structure that we have in place, which really, which really puts the the responsibility of, you know, making sure that people are are being taken care of during this time, on the leadership in the office. And at the end of the day, as to the question of what do I do, I, I have to lead this office, and and I depend heavily on on uh, my my other leaders in the office to make sure that the, the people that they're responsible are, are being taken care of. And so they've done a phenomenal job and, and I am just tremendously proud of the, the work that, that the people in my office have done as public servants during this really incredible time. John, I, before we, we wrap things up here, and I'm gonna ask everybody a final question, but I, I did want to ask you one more question about the, the first point you made in that last answer. And you said there's an urgency to getting back to some sense of normalcy. Are you saying that you feel there's some connection possibly between the changes we've had to make, had to make uh, uh, to the justice process and the surge in shootings and homicides in our community. Is there, is there a connection there or is that what you're saying? I think, I think that this is going to be studied uh, to, to great detail because um, my, my concern, my greatest concern is that we not as a community accept this as normal. That's, that, that's it. I am not saying that, um, that our, our response to this should be, for example, um, to, to double down on the traditional uh, law enforcement responses. To this. It's the exact opposite. I think what we've learned from uh, a public health crisis is that we have to double down on putting resources into the places where they're going to have the greatest impact. And that has to be in the community itself. And so, so I say the urgency, though, is that there still is a, a close connection um, to being able to intervene in some form so that you don't see the, the effects spiral out of control. Like I say, my, my greatest fear is that we as a community would ever accept years like this last year as just being normal. Um, we can't do that. We, we have to be committed to making sure that this is in fact the safest and healthiest and creating the conditions for prosperity for everybody uh, in this community. Chief Judge Crigiano, did you wanna add anything to that, to, to, to that last part of our conversation there? No, I mean, the, I think the one thing that is really important is that we are, are actually understanding that as an issue and we are talking about it in our meetings um, and it's not putting on the back burner. So we've had, I think we've had countless meetings on it and are trying to address it. I think this, this pandemic uh, and the unrest this summer has really you know, uncovered a lot of the effects of racial, economic uh, and health inequities in our community. We're all responsible for that and if we, are playing a role in that we need to know and we need to adjust. I think, um, you know, the pandemic and shutting down and trying to come up slowly has allowed us um, a grand opportunity to take a look at what we're doing and how we're doing it and do it much better. Um, and I think at least the groups I'm involved in, my colleagues, my leadership team, we're committed to looking at um, coming back in a different way that that makes it better. But I agree, there's an urgency. I hear it all the time. I see it in the you know the faces of my colleagues and litigants and everybody. We need to get up, but we also have to be careful about how we're going to do that and do it right. Yeah, this is this is my final question. And actually, I think you just touched on it. I, I read something that the the county clerk John Barrett said, and he said something to the effect. He said, "When it's done, in other words, when the virus is done, we may be a better operation for it." Do you agree with that, Chief Judge Crigiano? And I'll go right down the list. Yeah, and I and frankly, 
pre-pandemic, we were all striving for that anyway. So this has just given us more urgency to do that. And that's why I said in these meetings that I was able to join now as chief, um, we are collaborating with people who I don't think anybody would thought we would collaborate with before to try to create a better community, a better justice system. We have a long way to go. It's gonna be difficult, but I think this pandemic has uncovered some things and we're paying attention to it. Um, and so I think we're heading in a, in a better direction, but we have to be committed to it and it's gonna take some time and a lot of energy. Judge Mosley, have uh, lessons that have been learned during this pandemic, will they, will they make us better coming out of it? No, no doubt about it. Um, as uh, Mary mentioned, this pivot to try to make us more uh, accountable to each other and how we function as a court system. Court system used, used to be really rigid. Um, I like to say, you know, when you put we ahead of uh, I, you turn illness to wellness, right? And so um, th that's the whole point that we're trying to do. We're trying to make it so that the system is more accountable um, to each other, to the community, all the things that happened this summer in regards to bringing awareness to um, social determinants and how people are treated. It has made us become a, a better system. I'm speaking for the whole court system. Um, we are more accommodating. Um, we are definitely more accessible than we have ever been. And I think when it's all said and done, we're going to come out not only as a better system, but as a better community. John Chisholm, you agree with that? I do. It, particularly if we, if we really um, absorb and learn and practice what, what, we, what we have learned in the last year, and, um, and we really emphasize that you can't neglect your, your, your public health resources and, and infrastructure, and you really have to get to the heart of this, this uh, housing insecurity issue. Um, I, I think if we were to, to uh, double down on those two areas, we would actually see the need for criminal justice intervention uh, recede greatly. And Tom Reed, I'll give you the final word. Yeah, no, I um, I see tremendous um, opportunity coming out of this, frankly. Uh, a lot of relationships have been strengthened and broadened in their content as a result of the work that had to be done to make their us uh, respond effectively to the pandemic. Those are relationships across systems, housing, mental health, you know, other entities in the county and in the city that really are integral to having a healthy and safe community. I think that the discussions we've already had about how Zoom technology can really help make courts more accessible to people and make them more efficient. I think that is an area where there are real gains. Uh, lastly, I will mention that one consequence of the pandemic was that in order that the, our jail have single selling and in order that our House of Corrections have a ability to have social distancing, we've kept the population in those facilities lower and there are just every possible indication that that's better. There are fewer incidents within those institutions. The people who run them report a lot of very encouraging signs that they would not have predicted happening as a result of that. And the data tends to show us that the more conservative use of those, those jail beds has not been the thing that's driven some of the social suffering and disease that we've been discussing in this this, uh, this uh, meeting today. So I see lots of ways in which we are going to learn really valuable lessons from what we were forced to go through. It's been a learning experience for all of us, that is uh, for certain. I wanna thank each of you, uh, Tom Reed, uh, John Chisholm, Judge Mosley, Chief Judge Trigiano. It's great to visit with you. Thanks so much for sharing the story of the last year, which has been a remarkable year in so many ways. I uh, want to thank you and also want to thank the people watching today. Thanks very much for tuning in. We'll see you next time on The Issues.